Okay, our next speaker is uh, Peter Cameron, and his talk will be on the Grunberg Kegel graph and graphs defined on groups. Oh, thank you very much, Elena. And uh, I'm very glad to be in Novosibirsk again, in spirit at least. If it, in practice, I'm actually in this place here, St. Andrews. Um, so, as, I, as it says, this is partly joint work with Natalia, who's going to be giving the next talk. Uh, this is a, a beautiful garden that I've been wandering around for the last little while. Um, uh, so I have a, a long manuscript about uh, graphs to find on groups. There's a version of it on the archive, which I'll give you the uh, number for at the end, but it's grown since I put that version up and I hope to post a new version sometime soon. It's up to 75 pages now, but um, I'm going to just take you around one little corner of this garden. Uh, the next door garden is about the Grunberg Kegel graph, which we're going to hear quite a bit more of today. And uh, um, where these two gardens meet, there is some very nice stuff happening. So uh, this is the plan of the talk. The Grunberg Kegel graph of a finite group, I'll define this a little more formally later. You take the set of prime divisors of the order of the group uh, as the vertex set. You put an edge from the prime P to the distinct prime Q, if and only if G contains an element of order PQ. And uh, Grunberg and Kegel introduced this to study the group ring of G, but it has a number of other applications as well. But as well as that, there are many other graphs associated with a group. Usually the vertex set is either G or else a very large part of G, maybe all the non-identity elements or all the non-central elements or something like that. So if G is something like the monster, this is a huge graph, whereas the grunberg kegel graph is a tiny little graph. Um, so some of the graphs that I'll be talking about are listed here, the commuting graph, the power graph, the enhanced power graph, the deep commuting graph. I'll explain all these shortly, but the interesting thing is that in a surprising number of cases, knowing the grunberg kegel graph, this very small graph, gives you a lot of information about these much larger graphs here. And so I'm going to give you four specific instances where that is true, where we have uh, this uh, information about these very large graphs coming from knowing the grunberg kegel graph of the group. So um, here are the four topics that I will be uh, talking about. Uh, first of all, I have these various types of graphs, which I've uh, mentioned on the last slide. If two groups G and A, two groups may have isomorphic graphs of one of those types, commuting graphs or one of the others. If they do, then they have the same grunberg kegel graph. So uh, th that already points out that there is a very close connection between the two things. If you have a group whose center is trivial, then it's reduced commuting graph, which means you just look at the uh, non-identity elements and ask whether that's connected. It's connected if and only if the grunberg kegel graph is connected. Thirdly, uh, could two of these graphs be equal? Well, you can say something for various possible equalities between them, but the particular one I'm going to talk about, the enhanced power graph is equal to the power graph if and only if the grunberg kegel graph has no edges. And uh, there is now, uh, uh, Natalia and I have a complete determination of groups with this property. And finally, uh, if you want, uh, I'm going to tell you about a class of graphs called co-graphs. These are actually more important than they appear at first glance, but um, when is, the, when is the power graph of a group a co-graph? This is an unsolved problem, but we have a necessary condition and a sufficient condition in terms of the grunberg kegel graph. So you can look at the grunberg kegel graph. Sometimes it tells you, yes, the, the, uh, the, the uh, power graph is a, co a co-graph. Sometimes the converse implication holds, but the conditions don't match up. And indeed, I will show you an example uh, to say that there is no condition which is both necessary and sufficient purely in terms of the Grunberg-Kegel graph. And uh, if you're trying to answer this question, 
even for rather easy groups like PSL2Q, you get into some very difficult number theoretic questions tackling this problem. So um, here are Grunberg and Cagle. I'm the so I'm old enough that I knew these people. So let me just say a little bit about them. Carl Grunberg was my colleague for um, essentially 20 years at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and uh, there he is. Uh, and he worked in cohomology and integral representation of groups particularly, but various other things as well. And uh, it's certainly a, a pleasure for me to remember him in this talk. Otto Kegel, I didn't know so well, but when I was a student in Oxford, at a certain time, he came once a week to lecture on locally finite groups. I believe that at the time he was visiting Bert Verfritz in London, they were writing a book about locally finite groups. And uh, uh, so it was arranged that he would come to Oxford once a week to lecture to us. So there are Grunberg and Cagle. Here's their graph, sometimes called the prime graph. And uh, um, I used to call it the prime graph, but Natalia told me very firmly that it was the Grunberg Cagle graph. So I'm a little bit reluctant to name things after mathematicians because it's so easy to get it wrong. Um, so they were concerned with uh, the integral group ring of, of a group, and in particular, whether the augmentation ideal was decomposable. And this turned out to be connect, uh, related to the connectivity of the uh, grunberg kegel graph. <clears throat> so as I said, the vertex set is a set of prime devices of the order of G, which according to Cauchy's theorem is the set of orders of elements of prime order in G. So this is a, a subset of all the element orders in G. It's just the, the primes that occur. And there's an edge from P to Q, if and only if G contains an element of order P, Q, which is equivalent to saying that you can find an element of order P and an element of order Q, which commute with one another. And uh, the main result of Grunberg and Cagle, which was in an unpublished manuscript in 1975, was essentially a characterization of groups whose grunberg kegel graph is disconnected, um, which in their terms led to decomposability of the augmentation ideal of the group ring. So the result was published by Williams, a student of Grunberg, a few years later. Um, and uh, you're going to hear quite a lot about the grunberg kegel graph in this session of the conference. Uh, so I will tell you a few things, but then other people will tell you a lot more. So uh, my connection, my interest is particularly how it connects with some of these other graphs. So as I said, it's very much smaller than the order of G, but um, it does tell you a lot of structure about um, these other graphs defined on G. So here are the four particular graphs that I'm going to be telling you about. First of all, the commuting graph, which goes back to the famous paper of Brower and Fowler in 1955, where they showed that uh, essentially there are only a finite number of finite simple groups that could have a given involution centralizer. And uh, they didn't actually use the word graph in their paper, uh, they, but they, were very much concerned with uh, whether the commuting graph is connected. So the commuting graph has vertex set G. Some people want the vertex set to be something different. And I'll talk to that later. So let's just do it in the largest possible uh, setting. The commuting graph has vertex set G. Two vertices are joined if and only if they commute. And you would get a loop at every vertex, but uh, I'm going to suppress the loops and just talk about a simple graph. And here's an example. Here are two examples, in fact, the dihedral group and the quaternion group of order eight. Here are standard uh, uh, presentations of them. And if you use those particular presentations, then the same names of elements label the graph in, label the same graph uh, to give you the commuting graph. 
1 and a squared in both cases are the um, central elements. So these ones marked in red form the center of the group in either case. And you can see that they're joined to everything else. And the ones not joined fall into three sets of two. In the quaternion group, these are the three subgroups of order four. In the dihedral group, there's one subgroup of order four. And then there's a pair of commuting involutions and another pair of commuting involutions. So there's an example. So two groups can have the same commuting graph. Uh, the power graph. So this didn't uh, first appear in the literature until 1999, as far as I'm aware, uh, defined by Kellerov and Quinn. Uh, so to define the power graph, I'm going to first of all define the directed graph, the directed power graph of a group. The vertex set is the whole group. And we put a directed edge or arc from G to H. If H is a power of, oh, sorry, that should be a lowercase g. Um, so I put an edge from G to H of H is a power of G. And again, I don't put any loops, though this definition would naturally give you a loop at every vertex. The power graph is obtained simply by ignoring the directions. Uh, so you join G to H if one is a power of the other. And also, if G is a power of H and H is a power of G, I just put a single edge between G and H. So the definition is G and H are joined if one is a power of the other. And the power graph doesn't uniquely determine the directions, but it is known that at least for finite groups, if two graph groups have isomorphic power graphs, then they have isomorphic directed power graphs. So the, um, uh, you may not be able to say, well, this, ed this particular edge is the one that goes from G to H, but you can at least determine it up to isomorphism. And if you want an example to think about, think about the cyclic group of order six. The identity is a power of everything. There are two generators, each of which has everything else as a power of it. So the, the identity is a sink, the generators are sources, but when you forget the directions, you can't distinguish between them. They're uh, completely indistinguishable. But once you choose which one is the identity, the other directions follow. And uh, so if you go back to this example we had before, this is, the, is actually the power graph of the quaternion group. As, as I said, these three leaves of the book are cyclic groups of order four. And um, in the dihedral group, that's not the case because these elements over here are involutions and uh, they're not powers of each other. And uh, A squared isn't a power of, of the other involutions either. So, the um, uh, power graph has fewer edges, but um, yeah, okay, so that's the power graph. Then uh, the next is the power graph sort of built up a little bit. And uh, the complementary graph was first defined in 2007 by Abdullahi and Hassan Abadi. Uh, they called it the non-cyclic graph, but uh, uh, completely independently, it was uh, defined with this name, enhanced power graph in 2017. This is how it works. We join G to H if there's an element K such that both G and H are powers of K, right? So they're, they're both powers of the same element. And another way of saying that is that G and H join if and only if the subgroup that they generate is cyclic. That's true because if G and H both lie in the subgroup generated by K, they generate a subgroup of a cyclic group and uh, a subgroup of a cyclic group is necessarily cyclic. So uh, that's another way of putting it. G and H are joined if and only if the group they generate is cyclic. And so Abdullahi and Hassan Abadi looking at the complementary graph. So you join two things with the subgroup they generated is non-cyclic. That's why they called it the non-cyclic graph, I think. And so we saw that the power graph determines up to isomorphism, the directed power graph. And the directed power graph determines the enhanced power graph, because if you know the directions, then you can find this K such that there's an arc from K to G and an arc from K to H. And uh, 
that's the condition for them to be joined in the enhanced paragraph. So the directed paragraph determines the enhanced paragraph completely. And the converse is, is actually true. If two graphs have isomorphic enhanced paragraphs, then they have isomorphic paragraphs. Um, that was proved recently. Um, and uh, you can look in my 75 page manuscript to see all that if you really want to know. Uh, so the final one is not even published yet. It's on the archive. Boy and Kuzma and I have a, a, a preprint on the archive that defines this thing that we call the deep commuting graph. It goes between the enhanced paragraph and the commuting graph. So the vertex set is still G. Now, when do you join two vertices G and H? What you do is you don't, you don't just ask for them to commute, you ask something stronger. You say, if you take any central extension of G, that is any group H that has a subgroup Z in its center, such that H over Z is isomorphic to G, if you have that set up, you can pull G and H back to elements of the group capital H, A and B say, uh, and you require that A and B should commute, and you require that this should hold for every possible central extension. So this, uh, if, two vert if G and H are joined in the deep commuting graph, then they're joined in the commuting graph, but the converse is not necessarily true. So here's uh, uh, what we show in the uh, paper is that uh, you don't have to look at every central extension to decide this. That would be completely impractical. Suffice it to take just a single central extension. There's a thing called a sure cover. And the way that works is you take this central subgroup not only to lie in the center of H, but also to lie in the derived group of H. And subject to that condition, you want this Z to be as large as possible. It's called a sure cover because sure proved that with this restriction, Z is determined uniquely up to isomorphism, though the group H may not be. So for example, if you take the Klein group, it has two sure covers and they are precisely the dihedral and quaternion groups of order eight. So if we go back again to that picture, uh, Here's the, commuting, here's the commuting graph of the dihedral and quaternion groups of order eight. And the central subgroup is this one marked in red. So when you factor that out, you essentially just collapse the uh, vertical lines in this figure. So you get a graph with four vertices uh, corresponding to uh, the four cosets <coughs> of the central subgroup. And that quotient group is the Klein group. And you see that the graph you get is just the star, whereas the commuting graph of the Klein group is the complete graph because it's an abelian group, but it's deep commuting graph is a star. So you've lost three edges. Uh, yes, three edges. And these graphs form a hierarchy, right? Because um, if you have two vertices that are joined in the power graph, one's a power of the other. So they're certainly both powers of the same element, namely one of the two of them. So they're joined in the enhanced power graph. If they're joined in the enhanced power graph, they're joined in the deep commuting graph. That's a little harder to see. Uh, uh, the explanation is down here. If they're joined in the deep commuting graph, then obviously they're joined in the commuting graph. So why is, it, why is the enhanced power graph contained in the deep commuting graph? Well, let's suppose you take an edge of the enhanced power graph. Let's remember what that means. It means that uh, the group generated by G and H is cyclic. So it's generated by a single element K, right? Now you take as any central extension of G and let Z be the kernel. So H over Z is isomorphic to G. And you have to pull these elements A, B and C back to uh, their cosets of Z in H because H over Z is isomorphic to G. So, you, so now our assertion is that uh, the group generated by G and H is the same as the group generated by K. So the group generated by Z, A and B is the same as the group generated by Z and C. Now Z is a subgroup in the center of H and C is one more element. And it's an easy exercise, elementary exercise in group theory that if you take this, a subgroup in the center of a group, and one more element 
they generate an abelian group. Well, that's essentially because C commutes with everything in Z, everything in Z commutes with everything else in Z, and so all the generators commute, so the group is abelian. So that says that A and B lie in an abelian group, therefore they commute, so they are joined in the, uh, in the commuting graph of H, so little g and little h are joined in the commuting graph of, in the deep commuting graph of g. And uh, one further observation, for each of these types of graphs that I've been talking about, uh, if you take a group G, you define that graph, it's invariant under the automorphism group of G. So here's our first connection with the uh, grunberg kegel graph, which I will abbreviate to the GK graph. So take one of the four types that I've been talking about, power graph, enhanced power graph, deep commuting graph, or commuting graph. And suppose you have two groups, G and H, for which the corresponding graphs are isomorphic. So think dihedral and quaternion. Then the grunberg kegel graphs of G and H are equal. So this is fairly easy to prove, so I'm going to show you the proof. I'm going to first take two of these four. I'm going to take the enhanced power graph or the commuting graph because there's a big similarity between those two. In the enhanced power graph, two elements are joined if they generate a cyclic group. In the commuting graph, the definition wasn't like this, but you can easily see that two elements are joined if and only if they generate an abelian group. And so that means that a maximal clique in the enhanced power graph is a maximal cyclic subgroup of G. And a maximal clique in the commuting graph is a maximal abelian subgroup of G. So if P and Q are joined in the uh, GK graph, that will be true if and only if. So there's an element of order PQ in G that's contained in a maximal cyclic subgroup. It's also contained in a maximal abelian subgroup. And so there will be a maximal clique in the graph whose order is divisible by PQ. So to decide whether to join P and Q in the grunberg kegel graph, you just look to see whether there's a maximal clique whose order is divisible by PQ. So that shows that the um, uh, isomorphism of the enhanced power graph or commuting graph implies same GK graph. Uh, for the deep commuting graph, a similar argument works, but you have to work in a sure cover of G rather than in G itself. And finally, for the um, power graph, well, we, I, show, I told you that if the two power graphs are isomorphic, then the enhanced power graphs are also isomorphic. And so we've already proved it for enhanced power graphs, so it follows also for power graphs. So that's the, uh, the proof of that theorem. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, connectedness. As I said, that goes right back to the paper of Brower and Fowler. The, at, the, at the very start of that paper, they, they, as I said, they don't use the word graph. They say, we're going to uh, uh, define the distance between two elements of the group to be the length of the shortest chain of elements connecting them, not containing the identity, but such that uh, each one commutes with the next. So that's just a path in the uh, commuting graph. So they are talking about the distance in what's sometimes called the reduced commuting graph. You leave out the identity and uh, just take that. So uh, the reduced commuting graph is uh, defined to have vertex set G minus the center. The reason for that is because elements at the center are joined to everything else. So if you, left the, if you left any central element in, there would always be a path of length at most two between any two vertices. And so we, uh, uh, we don't want to uh, uh, trivialize the problem like that. So to make it an interesting problem, we remove the elements at the center and we ask whether that graph is connected. And quite a lot is known about this. There's been a lot of research on this question. Uh, some very interesting results. But all I want to point out is one simple little result that fits so nicely into my theme. If you have a finite group whose center is the identity, so that for the reduced commuting graph, you only have to leave out the identity. If the center is the identity, then the reduced commuting graph of G is connected 
if and only if the Gruenberg Kegel graph of G is connected. So um, that tells you precisely when the, um, uh, for groups of trivial center, when the Gruenberg Kegel graph of G is connected. Now, in a sense, this misses some of the most interesting parts because, uh, uh, for example, it's known that uh, for arbitrary groups, the uh, Grunberg, the diameter of a connected component of the commuting graph can be arbitrarily large, but the groups that, that the groups that do this are um, two groups, and the center of a non-trivial two group is non-trivial, so they don't fall under this theorem. Of course, if you have a two group, the only prime divisor is two, so the Grunberg uh, Kegel graph is uh, rather trivial in that case. Okay, so now on to the question of equality. Uh, so let's, uh, we have these four graphs. So the power graph, the enhanced power graph, the deep commuting graph, and the commuting graph, they form a hierarchy. Each one is contained in the next. So a natural question is, when can two of them be equal? Uh, well, there is, there are answers of some kind known for all of these questions, I'm going to talk about one particular case, which is uh, when the power graph and the enhanced power graph coincide. So which groups have the property that their power graph and their enhanced power graph coincide? Uh, so uh, we need to talk about this class of so-called EPO groups. That's elements have prime power order. So this is a group in which Every element has prime power order. So any P group for any prime P will be one of these. The symmetric group of degree three, it has order six, but the elements only have orders one, two, and three. And uh, the study of these goes right back to the time when I was a student in Oxford. And uh, many of my former colleagues there worked on this, Graham Hickman, Patrick Martineau, and Brian Stewart in particular. Uh, but uh, now, uh, thanks in part to the classification of finite simple groups, and thanks to a lot of hard work by Natalia, we have a complete answer. But this is why we're interested in them. For a finite group G, the following three conditions are equivalent. First, that G is an EPO group. All its elements have prime power order. Secondly, the Grunberg Kegel graph has no edges can have arbitrarily many vertices, but no edges. And thirdly, the power graph is equal to the enhanced power graph. So let me say a little bit about why this is true. Uh, equivalence of the first two conditions is obvious from the definitions. To have an edge in the grunberg kegel graph, you have to have an element of order PQ, where P and Q are distinct primes. So to say that it's an EPO group is precisely to say there are no such elements of order PQ, where P and Q are distinct primes, and so the Grunberg Kegel graph has no edges. So the first two conditions are equivalent. Why is that equivalent to the third? Well, if two elements have prime power order and generate a cyclic group, then one of them must be a power of the other, because that's true in a cyclic group of prime power order. Um, the element of smaller order will be a power of the element of larger order. So that means that if you have an EPO group, um, every element has prime power order. And so if two of them generate a cyclic group, then one is a power of the other. Generating a cyclic group says being joined in the enhanced power graph, one being a power of the other says being joined in the power graph. So in an EPO group, the power graph and enhanced power graph are equal. But conversely, if G is not an EPO group, then it has an element which is not of prime power order. So its order is divisible by two distinct primes, let's say P and Q. Well, you can just now take some power of that element to get an element whose order is exactly P times Q. And therefore there's an edge in the Grunberg Kegel graph. So if the GK graph has an edge, then the group is not an EPO group, which gives us the converse. So that's why this is true. And so in order to classify the groups with um, power graph equal to enhanced power graph, we need to classify the EPO groups. And here is the classification. And uh, uh, a paper on the archive, which I'll give you the uh, number for at the end, 
gives you the uh, classification. Here it is. I just wrote it out on this slide. I don't want to spend a lot of time drawing on this slide, but uh, as I said, it could be that there's just one prime. So G is a P group for some prime P. Could be that there are two distinct primes and then G would have to be a solvable Frobenius or two Frobenius group. Uh, I haven't defined two Frobenius groups, but uh, let me just give you an example of a group like this, the symmetric group of degree four. The symmetric group of degree four has a normal subgroup, which is the alternating group of degree four. That has a normal subgroup, which is the Klein group. And so the alternating group is a Frobenius group, stabilizer of two points is trivial. And uh, the Frobenius kernel is the um, Klein group. Now, if you factor out the Klein group, S4 over the Klein group is isomorphic to S3, and S3 is a Frobenius group uh, with uh, kernel cyclic of order three. So that's what a two Frobenius group looks like. It's two Frobenius groups where the uh, Frobenius complement of the bottom one is the Frobenius kernel of the top one. So they're rather restricted. If there are three primes, then you have this list of possible groups, or uh, possibly more, uh, uh, with um, um, uh, normal two subgroups. So this is a PSL sitting on top of um, the uh, natural module, uh, or direct product of copies of the natural module. Uh, there's a group with four primes, another group with four primes that again has a normal two subgroup, uh, modulo that it's, as, it's um, one of two Suzuki groups, and that's the lot. So that's the classification of the EPO groups, finally. So uh, when I was a student in Oxford, this was long before the classification, and you really had to work hard to get any results along these lines. Now. Uh, CFSG doesn't make it the problem trivial, but it does make it very much easier than it was back then. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's the question of when the power graph and the enhanced power graph are equal. It is precisely for the groups on this slide. So now I come to a class of graphs called co-graphs. Now, you may not see when I define these why they're important, but I'm going to uh, uh, hopefully persuade you that this is a very important class of graphs, uh, particularly for people who are interested in graphs defined on groups. So a co-graph is a graph that has no induced subgraph, which is the four vertex path. So the path with four vertices and three edges. Uh, and if you think about the four vertex path, the complementary graph, to the four vertex path is again a four vertex path. So that's so that means if a graph forbids the four vertex path, then it also its complement also forbids the four vertex path. So the class of co-graphs is closed under complementation. It's the first thing we can observe. And uh, here are some of the remarkable properties of this class of graphs. First of all. If a co-graph on more than one vertex is connected, then its complement is disconnected. Now, it's always true for any graph that if a graph is disconnected, its complement is connected, because if a graph is disconnected, its complement at least contains a complete bipartite graph. But for co-graphs, the converse is true. If a co-graph is connected, its complement is disconnected. And indeed, co-graphs form the smallest non-empty class of graphs, which is closed under the operation of complement and disjoint union. It's also clear, I didn't say this, it's also clear that the uh, disjoint union of co-graphs is a co-graph, because if you have a disjoint union, if it happened to contain a four vertex path, that would have to lie in one of the components. So it's closed under complement and disjoint union, and that means that you can build every co-graph by starting with the one vertex graph and applying the operations of disjoint union and complement. And that means that co-graphs build up in a kind of tree-like structure. You take a bunch of 
um, connected co-graphs and take their disjoint union, then you're allowed to take the complement of that and you're allowed to iterate this process. And this tree-like structure means that uh, algorithms which are hard on, uh, on all graphs are often very, very easy on co-graphs. They're a very nice algorithmic class. And the other nice thing we can say about them is that the automorphism group of a co-graph can be built from the trivial group by the operations direct product and wreath product with a symmetric group. Because if you think about this building up, if you take a disjoint union of connected graphs, its automorphism group is, you first of all divide the connected graphs into isomorphism types, you take the wreath product of the automorphism group of one of those graphs with the symmetric group permuting that the copies the components around, and then you take the direct product of those over all the non-isomorphic components. And so this gives you a very powerful structure theory for the automorphism groups of these graphs. So they have a lot of very nice properties, but there's another nice property which makes them very relevant to the sort of graphs that I'm talking about, which I will now come to, um, which is twins. Now we heard about twins in a, a few lectures already in this meeting. I think my definition of twins is slightly different. I'm going to say the two vertices are twins if they have the same neighbors, possibly except for one another. So if you have two vertices that are not joined, then to say they're twins means that the, the neighborhood of one is equal to the neighborhood of the other. That is the open neighborhood, not including the vertices themselves. So I will call a pair of vertices like that open twins. If they are joined, then of course they can't be um, open twins because each is in the neighborhood of the other, but their closed neighborhoods could still be equal. And I call them closed twins if their closed neighborhoods are equal. So two vertices are twins if they have the same neighbors, possibly accepting one another. So they may be open twins with the same neighborhood or closed twins where they're joined to one another and their other neighbors coincide. So uh, being twins is an equivalence relation. And if you have, uh, if you take that equivalence relation, then the automorphism group of the graph has a normal subgroup, which is, acts as the symmetric group on each twin class. That's because if I have a pair of twin vertices, I can interchange them, fixing everything else. That's an automorphism of the graph because the neighbors of those two, apart from possibly one another, are the same. So a transposition, swapping two twins, is an automorphism. And th these transpositions generate the direct product of symmetric groups on the twin classes. And uh, now there are a lot of properties of graphs, not all properties, but quite a lot that are not affected by the operation of just collapsing a pair of twins to a single vertex. Um, so if I tell you, if I give you a graph and I say, this came by collapsing some twins and I tell you the vertex set that I started with and the equivalence relation, then you can recover the graph that I got to after the collapsing. So, uh, well, let's, so let's collapse a pair of twins. There might still be twins, so I continue collapsing until there are no more twins. And it's a little bit surprising at first sight, but the graph that you get is independent of the sequence of collapses that you did of twins to get to it. Um, so it's not hard to prove, you can think about it. Uh, if you, uh, so you can take a graph, you can collapse all the twins down and get something which uh, for reasons that will become clear very soon, I will call the co-kernel of the graph, uh, just to give it a name. That doesn't have any connection with uh, homological algebra or anything else. It's just a name for this graph that you get by doing all the possible twin reductions. So what's the connection with co-graphs? A graph is a co-graph if and only if its co-kernel is the one vertex graph. So co-graphs are precisely the graphs that when you start twin reduction, you collapse it right down to a single vertex. Um, and uh, so that tells you that um, if you're interested in properties that are 
in, uh, that don't depend on twin reduction, then uh, if it's a co-graph, it'll have the same, those properties uh, if precisely if the one vertex graph does. Now, what, what's this got to do with the graphs I'm talking about? Well, a graph in my hierarchy, so the power graph, enhanced power graph, deep commuting graph and commuting graph, these graphs always have twins. For each of the types of graph introduced earlier, there are, there's always a non-trivial twin relation. Indeed, they have many, many, many uh, pairs of twins. And this means by what I just said, that if you take one of those graphs and you say, well, what's its automorphism group? Uh, you will get a huge group because it will contain all this rubbish, this direct product of symmetric groups on the twin classes. And I remember that uh, um, some, a few years ago, I started working with my colleague, Culver Roney Dougal on um, uh, the generating graph of a group. And uh, I thought, well, okay, so let's take the alternating group of degree five. That isn't a very big group. Uh, so define the generating graph, ask what its automorphism group is. And I came at this huge number that filled the whole line of the computer screen. And uh, I didn't realize at the time what was going on. It's because most of it is just symmetric groups on the twin classes. Uh, so here's the proof. Uh, if you have an element of order bigger than two, then there will be other elements that generate the same cyclic group as that one. So if G has order bigger than two and D is co-prime to the order of G, then G and G to the D are twins. Uh, so indeed, in all of the cases I'm talking about, they will be closed twins because so they commute with one another, one's a power of the other. So they, they're joined in all of those four graphs that I was talking about. So uh, so G, if there's an element of order bigger than two, then you get uh, uh, um, twins. So you get a class, a twin class from this uh, for each, I'm sorry, uh, you get a twin class from this from each cyclic subgroup of your group, except order two. Now, of course, the only case that I haven't produce twins in is where every element apart from the identity has order two. That's an elementary abelian two group. Well, in that case, all of these graphs that I've been talking about are relatively trivial. The commuting graph is complete. Uh, in the power graph, for example, uh, the identity is joined to everything, but the other vertices are mutually non-adjacent, so it's just a star. And it's easy to see that complete graphs and stars have twins. So there are always lots of twins in these graphs. And so you want to do uh, twin reduction. And so because you want to do twin reduction, you want to know, well, when is this going to sort of reduce the graph out of existence, just down to a trivial graph? So when is the graph a co-graph? And uh, so let's start with the power graph. When is the power graph a co-graph? Uh, and um, so uh, here is a theorem. So the grunberg kegel graph does not determine this property, but it comes quite close. So if every connected component of the GK graph is a single vertex, in other words, if you have an EPO group, then the power graph is a co-graph. If G is non-solvable, and if the power graph is a co-graph, then every connected component of the GK graph uh, has size one or two, with possibly one exception, and the one exception is the connected component containing the prime two. If the group is non-solvable, then by the fight thompson theorem, two divides its order, so there will be a connected component containing the prime two, it might be larger than two, but all the other components have size one or two. So it seems that there's not a very big gap between these two theorems, uh, but uh, you can't give a condition purely in terms of the uh, grunberg kegel graph that decides when the power graph is a co-graph. Uh, if you look at the groups PSL211 and Mathieu group M11, <coughs> They have the same grunberg kegel graph. The primes are two, three, five, and 11. Uh, elements of order uh, five, 
don't commute with any other prime order elements and same for 11. So five and 11 are isolated vertices and uh, two and three, there are commuting elements of orders two and three in both of these groups. So two and three uh, are joined by an edge. Uh, so they have the same GK graph. The power graph of PSL211 is a co-graph. The power graph of M11 is not. And indeed, uh, so remember a graph is a co-graph if and only if it's co-kernel, the thing you get by twin reduction has uh, well, only one vertex. Well, the co-kernel of the graph for M11 has 1,212 vertices. Its automorphism group is precisely M11, the group you started off with. And it, I mean, this may very well be connected with some of the graphs that Andrea was telling us about because um, it has, a, there, it has, so the M11 has two fixed points and then it has, I think just four orbits if I remember correctly, two of length 165, one 220 and one 660. So you get nice, uh, sorry, those are the orbits. The graph is it, itself, I think is connected, but uh, I haven't looked very closely at this graph, but nice things happen. Uh, so what about PSL2Q? Um, well, uh, we can say more or less what happens with PSL2Q modulo number theory. So this is, the, this is what happens. Let Q be a prime power. So it might be a power of two, it might be a power of an odd prime. If it's a power of two, I let L and M be Q minus one and Q plus one respectively. And if Q is odd, I take Q minus one over two and Q plus one over two. So these, if you know the group PSL2Q, you'll recognize that L and M are the orders of the maximal cyclic subgroups apart from the ones of order the prime divisor of Q. So the power graph of PSL2Q is a co-graph if and only if each of L and M is either a prime power or the product of two distinct primes. So it's a slightly strange condition, but uh, uh, here's a question for number theorists, which they'll probably run screaming from the room. Uh, are there infinitely many prime powers for which the power graph of PSL2Q is a co-graph? So for which both of these conditions hold. It happens quite often. Uh, here are the, so for powers of two, for Q equals two to the D, D up to 200, there's quite an impressive looking list of uh, values for which uh, these conditions here are satisfied. So these are the ones for which the power graph of PSL2Q is a co-graph. It's true for 199, 167, but you see there are, there are, there are gaps. Uh, so this is related. We heard about the um, uh, Catalan conjecture, which is now a theorem. Uh, it's related to that, and it's related to Fermat and Mersenne primes, but uh, it's not quite the same as any of those things that number theorists have looked at. So that's PSL2Q. What about other simple groups? Well, I worked out a, a table of the small simple groups, um, and I've, I've, this table contains the sizes of the co-kernels of the four graphs that I was talking about on the first few non-abelian simple groups by order. And I put in one more, namely the non-generating graph. The non-generating graph, G and H are joined if and only if they don't generate the whole of the group. Now we know from the classification that every finite simple group can be generated by two elements. So for simple groups, this graph is not the complete graph, but also uh, if two elements commute, then they can't generate the group. So it contains the commuting graph. So the, this is another graph in the hierarchy above the commuting graph. And uh, remember when you look at this table that a graph is a co-graph if and only if it's a co-kernel has exactly one vertex. So uh, here is the table. You see, you get co-graphs quite a lot of the time, uh, but for some of those PSL2s, it doesn't seem to happen so much for other types of graph. Here's M11. I told you that the uh, co-kernel of the power graph had 1,212 vertices. Well, it's the same for the enhanced power graph, the deep commuting graph and the commuting graph, but the non-generating graph has about twice as many. 
Uh, so these are interesting numbers and you can look at them and you can wonder, look, there's A7 with, uh, again, all those four numbers equal. But here, they decrease as you go along. Here they increase. So strange things happen. But uh, you, you might look at that table and you say, oh, well, there are never any ones in this thing here. So the non-generating graph appears never to be a co-graph. Well, we can actually prove that. The non-generating graph of a non-abelian finite simple group is not a co-graph. Uh, uh, well, we know that the reduced non-generating graph, so when you remove the identity, uh, you get a connected graph. And if you look at the reduced generating graph, so you take two vertices and join them, if they generate, but uh, removing the identity, then uh, both of those graphs are connected. Indeed, um, there's a beautiful result recently by Bernes, Guralnik, and Harper that says that uh, gives a necessary and sufficient condition for the generating graph to have the property that any two vertices have a common neighbor. So for simple or nearly simple groups, uh, the, the, connect, the generating graph is very dense, very highly connected, but the non-generating graph as well, uh, a PhD student in St. Andrews, Saul Friedman, uh, has a very good bound. The non-generating graph with the identity removed has diameter at most five. So they're both connected. But you remember that uh, I told you that if you have a co-graph, if it's connected, its complement is not connected. So that connectedness demonstrates that uh, these graphs can't be co-graphs. So, but it's still, I think, an interesting question to find or estimate the number of vertices in the co-kernel. And uh, so uh, they're strange looking numbers, but um, one thing that you can say is, you remember that um, two elements that generate the same cyclic group are always twins. So twin reduction will certainly collapse down to one vertex for each cyclic subgroup. And therefore, the number of cyclic subgroups is an upper bound for the numbers that appear in any of these um, rows of the table. And sometimes it's uh, about that bound is met, sometimes it's not. So if you want to think about that question, a sort of interesting subsidiary question is, uh, for which groups is it true that if you start off by reducing each, uh, the twin relation in each cyclic group down to a single vertex, have you finished? Is that uh, uh, already a graph with no twins? Uh, so I think there are some nice group theoretic questions here that uh, some people might like to tackle. Well, that's all I have to say, but um, here are some references. So these are just recent references. So three of them are not published yet. Uh, this is the paper that uh, defined the enhanced power graph. Uh, this is this large manuscript that I was telling you about. So that's, it was, I went on the archive last month, but it's already grown quite a bit. I hope to put a new version on the archive fairly soon. So if you want a copy of that, it might be worth your while to just wait for a little bit or else just email me and ask me for a copy and I'll send you one. Uh, here's the paper with uh, Boyan Kuzma that defined the deep commuting graph. And here's my paper with Natalia that proved the, um, uh, oh, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, how do I go back? Um, like that. <laughs> yes, okay. So uh, here's the paper with Natalia that uh, among many other things, some of which she's going to tell you about in just a moment, uh, gives you the list of EPO groups. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, for your nice talk. Uh, any questions? Well, a lot oh, of information. Yeah, oh. yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, please, Pascal. So, um, 
I presume there are no characterizations for any of these graph classes that you talked about. Is there hope for characterization? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I very much doubt if you can get a characterization of the graphs themselves. Let me just tell you one thing that you can say. The power graph, for example, you can prove the power graph of any group is the comparability graph of a partial order and therefore is perfect and various other nice things. But every, every comparability graph of a partial order can be embedded as an induced subgraph. So they're universal for those. The other class I talked about are universal for all graphs. Every finite graph is embeddable as a, uh, an induced subgraph in one of these graphs for some group. So they are, they're, they're a sort of fairly big, rich class. And I don't think there's going to be an exact characterization of them for the most part.